but what I mean by conscious and self-aware is just this little thing people have of remembering a little bit about the choices that, or the decisions that they had to make recently. And uh, I think it's very easy to put machines in that. For example, if you ever use the programming language Lisp, which most people don't, uh, when you write a Lisp program, you can turn on something called trace. And then if the program ever gets into trouble, you can untrace, backtrace, and find out all the choices that it made and, and what it did. And so a program that keeps one of those uh, kind of uh, record system is, is profoundly, deeply conscious, I think. Now, if you talk to this Lisp program, it won't answer you. It doesn't know anything. And so I think consciousness is a really trivial and superficial aspect of what brains do. It's not very uh, hard to explain, as far as I'm concerned. But the point is people confuse consciousness with being smart. Uh, when Descartes says, if he ever said it, I think therefore I am, cogito ergo sum, uh, he reached a dead end instantly because there are no parts. Maybe part of me thinks, and maybe there are several parts that do different things, and maybe the word thinking is no good, but it's the kind of word you use for, what, what does the word think mean? I don't know if you ever work math problems, but sometimes you're trying to solve some equation, and you look at it, and you try this and that, and nothing seems to work, and then suddenly say, oh, of course. I should just replace x squared plus y squared by r squared. Uh, if you ever did high school analytic geometry, you know that that means you've replaced some angular coordinates by circular coordinates. Now, you might call that thinking, but you haven't the slightest idea what happened. You had a problem. All of a sudden, it got solved. Well, if you call, you say, I thought of this answer, that's almost the same as saying, I just watched another person solve it. Because you don't know the thousands of other little manipulations that went on inside parts of your mind that maybe one part said, why don't you consider R? Uh, remember last Wednesday or five years ago in, uh, when you were in high school or whatever, that worked. And another part said, uh, why don't you try replacing x by sine theta and y by cosine theta? And it says, you remember, that worked in trigonometry. Uh, most people don't find mathematics to be a vital part of their lives, but I do. And all of these things are happening. You haven't the slightest idea, and maybe they're struggling, and maybe Papert's principle kills both of those, and another agent comes over. And finally, after all the work, all the work is done, you say, I got an idea. One of the critical problems in, as far as I'm concerned, in all of computer science and psychology is knowing, finding a way to organize the body of knowledge that every child has. Maybe 10 million little facts about, or little fragments of skills about things in the ordinary world. A friend of ours named Doug Lennett uh, at MCC company in uh, Austin has, I think, the largest scale attempt to build a common sense database. It's called Psych, and it has proposed many interesting ways to encode common sense knowledge for a computer. But I wish there were a dozen such projects around the world competing with each other, because uh, without a without a struggle. Uh, you can never be sure that you're on the right track. Uh, progress comes through competition and comparison.
the way psych works, or the way they work there, is that they put some knowledge in, and then somebody asks the thing a question, and if it can't answer it, you say, oh, well, it doesn't know enough about fingernail polish or something. And then you tell it as much as you can think of about it, and then it says, well, why do people like that? And then you have to say, start building common sense knowledge about liking and what people like. And they get into all sorts of little caves and caverns and mazes of things that everybody knows that nobody's ever written down. And so eventually, the hope is that uh, it'll be hard to ask it questions that it doesn't know something about. But it hasn't got near that yet. He was a nice man. I, I was a whiz at electronics, so I used to hang around the lab helping with the automatic circuits and clip leads and switches and things. And uh, In fact, I don't think I ever discussed psychology with him because this is a case that I had a pretty good model of what he thought anyway. Maybe I was wrong. About 1949, I started designing a learning machine, which was a randomly connected neural net with reinforcement. And it got built in the summer of 1951. And it was a huge machine, about the size of a grand piano. And it had 40 of these. This is a, this is a Heb synapse neuron, I think you might call it. I can't find the inputs and outputs on this thing. Oh, yes, it's got a 11-pin plug at the bottom. And this is a kind of synapse. You put a pulse in, and it might come out, the output, with a certain probability. And this volume control knob here affects the probability. It goes from 0.1 to 0.99. And so you make a big machine out of these, and you put in a stimulus. And after a little while, a response comes out, having gone through various of these connections. And there was a bunch of ands and ors to connect them together. And then if you liked what it did, you pressed the reward button. And a motor is connected to this potentiometer. And if this tube is conducting, and you press the reward button, then it turns the the uh, knob up a little bit, and the probability is higher it'll do the same thing next time. And there's a extinguish button. If it has a response you don't like, and you press the extinguish button. So after a while, the thing does, for each stimulus, it tends to do what you approved of. The point of the later chapters of the Society of Mind is to suggest ways that knowledge can be represented in, in, a, in a brain. Uh, and my theory is that most things are made out of something like K-lines. Why K-lines? Just because a K-line is a way of connecting one brain cell to a bunch of others. So that's sort of down on the low level of neural nets. Now a frame is an assembly of little K-lines attached to various other circuits. and uh, so that's the next level of neural nets, where you're not talking about individual cells, but s little structured bundles of shells. And a transframe is a pair of semantic networks and a trajectory, which say, here's a situation in which Mary has the kite. That's what give means. And a little later, she's going to perform an action that will produce the second scene in which Jack has the kite. Well. Transframes are very important because they describe actions, and actions are the way you solve problems. Everyone knows that there are more than one kind of memory, or is it there is more than one kind of memory? <laughs> I give up. <laughs> I can't remember.
But there's three or four other theories that have a lot more structure. And uh, my favorite ones are uh, the general idea proposed by Sigmund Freud in uh, around the turn of the century, uh, 1900, that century, and one proposed by Jean Piaget in the 1930s through the 1960s. He's the Swiss child psychologist. He studied children. Well, Freud sort of studied children, too, but he studied them through uh, things that adults said about their childhood. Not quite so trustworthy, maybe. And the third one is Nico Tinbergen, who was a great animal behavior observer, and he learned perhaps more than everyone else put together, well, he and Conrad Lorenz, about how to describe what animals do. So these three people have better theories. They have theories with parts. Well, I can tell that that's an apple. And suppose that I wanted the apple, then I would have to reach it. And like in the block building episode, I'd have to somehow know where it is. Well, when I look there, I know what direction it's in because uh, it's projected directly on my retina. But how would I know its distance? Well, there's a dozen different ways. but. The simplest way is to use memory. When I'm looking at that, it looks about the same size as my fist would at arm's length. But I know that an apple is about the size of a fist. Of course, if that were a cherry, I would be fooled, and, but I don't have any trouble picking it up because I'm using my memory, having recognized the apple, knowing its size and shape and texture in my mind and matching the size and shape to, or rather matching the, the color and shape and, and those other features uh, to, the, uh, to the memories, then I look up the size. It's the operation of closing the ring and I know that it should be about that. And so you learn a lot about planning. And uh, I think even more, the child learns to visualize things that we never talk about, like, <coughs> what's it going to look like if I put this on? What will I see? I'll see two blocks on a big block. Now, being able to anticipate that is a very important thing, because if you can't anticipate the effects of actions in your head, then you can't plan multiple steps ahead. And again, if a robot's going to learn to build, it should be able to do that. Scott Fallman wrote a master. Suppose that you wanted to build Everyone knows that there are more than one kind of memory. Everyone knows that there's at least two kinds of memory. There's short-term memory with which you can remember a lot about what just happened. And there's long-term memory 
uh, with which you can remember a little bit about lots of things that happened a long time ago. Let's talk about emotions, because that's another subject that frightens people. If you talk about building a machine that will think, then people are all too ready to say, well, I can understand that you could make a machine reason. That's just logic. But how could you make it have emotions? And it's funny, but these people are actually lying in, in a certain sense because they don't see how you could make a machine reason. Uh, no one does. Uh, the researchers in artificial intelligence are still unable to get a computer to do most of the kinds of reasoning that we consider ordinary common sense. So people think that thinking is fairly straightforward, but emotions are incredibly obscure and subtle and hard to uh, understand and impossible for machines to uh, accommodate. I think it's just the opposite. Uh, thinking is very difficult. Uh, animals can't do it, uh, for example, uh, to any significant extent. What we call thinking, reasoning, solving tricky problems. Uh, and yet, if you consider emotions, animals are uh, pretty much as good at them as we are, uh, maybe better in some cases. Uh, they get angrier than people, characteristically, and hungrier, and sexier, and, uh, uh, and so forth. Well, what's an emotion? Why is it so hard to explain what they are? I think the reason is that uh, they're so simple, there's very little to say. Each emotion, each basic emotion, is just a different way of thinking. Well, I think the culture is turning us toward the idea that machines could be respectable because uh, it's certainly been a series of science fiction books and films in which the authors develop the character of the, the machine to be uh, sort of respectably human. But uh, usually there's a, a joke in it and that the thing only has one idea. And uh, Terminator movies are based on the theme that Yes, uh, this thing is a very smart machine, but it only has a single purpose, and uh, it's very clever about achieving this purpose, but there's something wrong with it as a person. You can't learn without trying things. They can't all work. So. The point is that in real life, you always see something new and you have to say, what's, what does this remind me of? What, uh, what situations is this that I've dealt with before does this resemble? And so, for common sense reasoning, it's the <coughs> it's it's the matching and how you describe a situation that's important. Logic assumes that the description is fixed, so you're not in a world of situations and objects. You're just presented with a sequence of symbols and then the logic tells you what to do with them. Lots of scientists and scholars study language. There are rooms full of books about language. But 
I haven't seen any sharp, clear, simple theories that try to explain how do you use language? How does a person speak and listen? Uh, so, for example, you can find books about grammar. There's a lot of stuff in the last 50 years about describing rules which allow you to, which would allow a machine, for example, to decide which strings of words are sentences and which aren't. Uh, never mind that when people talk informally, they they don't even use sentences. I just said they twice to make the point. Uh, that would be rejected because uh, there's no grammatical rule that permits it. So there's a sort of ideal. I'm not sure uh, where it comes from, but here's my theory. Uh, suppose, uh, take one of those sentences in the book like, uh, Mary gave Jack a kite, or something like that. If I told you that, I come in and say, Mary gave Jack a kite, what would your reaction be? You'd say, who is this nut uh, talking about these people I never heard of? So, okay, there's something wrong with the idea of a sentence to begin with. Uh, what am I really doing? When I said Mary gives Jack a kite, it was in the context of finding an example of language. And so I'm talking to you, the reader, and we know what the subject is. And now I want to put a certain structure in your mind. In other words, language is to make you think the same thing I'm thinking. So as far as I can see, the things that are common to language and that we see in the syntax of all languages have almost nothing to do with languages. They're just basic mental operations of saying, where do you, when you retrieve one memory, how do you attach it to uh, a structure that you're building in another one? So when a person talks to another person, we have content words which are uh, clues to say, bring out a certain K line, bring out a polyneme, bring out a certain frame and get it into short term memory, or at least a pointer to it. And then we have the grammar words or the function words, like the word and, uh, <coughs> which might connect two sentences. Uh, John liked kites and Mary liked books. That's a big long sentence. The word and says, uh, make a new structure, which is the joint assertion of these two other things. And so uh, what bothers me is that I haven't seen any books about language which talk about a person having a representation of an idea, uh, wants to communicate it to another person, you have to uh, retrieve the structures, find names for them, find grammatical tricks for connecting them, uh, then saying the resulting, saying something which causes the other person to rebuild something like it. Now, once you have this theory, then you can explain strange things like pronouns. Uh, John, Mary gave Jack the kite. She hoped that he would like it. It's only in children's books, which are written to make it hard for children to learn to read, that you'd say, Mary gave Jack the kite. Mary hoped that Jack would like it. Because when a normal person comes to the, that second Mary, they say, oh, that's a proper name. What is a proper name for? Proper name is to create a new object in your mind. The correct instruction for grammatical language, uh, normal language, is to use a pronoun saying, don't search your memory for a whole new object, search your short-term memory. In other words, the difference between a pronoun and a noun is that nouns point usually to long-term memory, pronouns point to short-term memory, and so uh, this is such a fundamental distinction that naturally, uh, Anybody inventing a language is going to have to do something like that, not because it's poetic or, uh, or abbreviated or something. It's because it gives a much clearer instruction to the listener's mind about what operation is next to be done.
you could say pick up the largest green block supported by the block that is next. If you go around the world today, you'll find laboratories trying to make computers see uh, just about everywhere, every big university and maybe every big company is trying to make uh, computer vision systems that, that work. And if you go into factories, occasionally you'll see a system where there's a TV camera looking at a, a construction platform and the machine is recognizing that all the screws have been put in this cover and, and that sort of thing. But there's no place you can find a computer today in 1993 that can look around the room and say, <clears throat> there's a person and there's a chair and there's a light and there's a telephone and there's a shelf of books. In other words, we have no computer vision systems that can recognize the kinds of ordinary objects, dogs and cats and cars and clothing that uh, a three or four year old can recognize. I think for short-term memory you have some very powerful hardware. These things called large K lines are like bundles of nerve fibers that reach almost everywhere in the part of the brain that uh, is involved in a particular memory. And it takes a sort of snapshot. That is, it has these little fibers which temporarily attach to whichever uh, brain cells are firing at the moment. And then if you operate activate that K-line a little bit later, it activates lots of the brain cells that were working during that particular activity, and so you're sort of brought back to that other state uh, that you were in a moment ago. So I think you only have a few of those. There's a famous phenomenon that George Miller called the magic number seven, plus or minus two, which uh, suggests that you can only keep track of, of that sort of number of things very clearly at any moment while you're thinking. Uh, what's the number seven? Well, nobody knows, but it, I suspect that uh, in the brain we'll find about that many populations of branches of cells that are used for these temporary K lines. It looks like to make a long-term memory takes a lot of work, it takes a while. If somebody gets hit on the head in an accident, they lose all the memory of the things that happened just before the trauma, post-traumatic amnesia. But what happens in that half hour or whatever it takes is not known. And here's what I think happens sort of like training a dog. Uh, your short-term memory remembers a bunch of things uh, in its temporary, large-scale, fast, expensive K lines. They're expensive because they uh, involve a lot of cells. Then, somehow, some part of the brain, uh, it's believed to be the hippocampus, which is a little organ right in the middle, uh, finds some territory that isn't fully filled up with uh, stuff. And what I bet happens is that it sort of says, do this. And the uh, piece of brain tissue that it's trying to train does something or other. And the hippocampus says, well, no, that's not quite right. Try again, but maybe change this. And maybe it takes a half hour for the short-term part of the brain to train some piece of long-term memory in the brain to do the same thing. So I think that's what happens. If you're training a dog, you probably have to uh, reward it a hundred times for doing the right thing and discourage it a hundred times when it does the wrong thing. And that's what I think is happening in that half hour.
the easiest thing to imagine is that when you think about blocks that somewhere in your head there's some little blocks floating around in your brain and that uh, the problem is that if I imagine a block here and a block here and now suppose in my mental world I imagine this block is slowly moving over to here what's going to happen well I expect to hear a little sound there it is uh, so now I assure you I'm thinking of a block here and one here and this it's almost there okay there's the click well you don't have to believe me but it's not true I don't believe that there is anything remotely resembling a block in my head I think I suggested in society of mind somewhere uh, maybe all you need is to imagine that uh, if you think of a picture of a picture frame of a, of a room maybe you just have to imagine that there's uh, there's sort of three ways three places there's this side that side and the middle and there's three heights there's near the floor near the ceiling and in the middle and if you sort of multiply those two together then there's just roughly nine places in the world and so maybe all I have to do is not visualize the block at all, but say, well, I'm imagining that <clears throat> this block is in the place which is at that end of the room near the ceiling. And this block, let's say it's at that end of the room near the middle. So this is in square one, two, three, four, five, and this is in square six. What do I have to do to get them to hit? Well, all I have to do is have it go to the left sideways about twice as fast as it's going up. Okay, then what'll happen the next time? It'll be in the middle, halfway between the middle and the top. And the next time it'll be there. And so you see, I'm doing it all with words practically. There's just nine locations. And then I have these complicated phrases like halfway between halfway and the top. That's the line between them. And so there's a representation which is in terms of nine places and the relations between them, which is about 20 more places. And uh, in effect, I can predict when these blocks will hit quite accurately, probably as well as any non-athlete. But a two-year-old probably can't do much of that. And so somewhere between two and five or two and six, uh, maybe the child develops 100,000 facts about the blocks world, and the blocks world becomes the real world. Okay, let's let's get into it. <laughs> right, I'm trying to imagine this book now. If you go this way, then you're walking into the text, right? Either way, you're going to walk off the screen eventually. Right, but you don't want to walk in front of the text. Well, maybe you do. <laughs> right. Oh, it doesn't have, they're all right pages. That's, that's funny. <laughs> okay. For some reason, people think funny has to do with happiness or lightheartedness or uh, good humor, but they don't understand that things like good humor are very sinister. When you laugh and feel good, it's because you think you've accomplished something, but what's happened is that the work, the problem has been erased. You think you've understood something, 
but a sensor has been installed to say never think about this again, it's not a problem. For some reason only a handful of people in history have recognized that humor is a negative emotion. Charles Darwin recognized this, that humor is to convince people that you're not an enemy and it enables you to get closer and closer and closer until you can tear them to shreds without the least resistance. So it's a very dangerous thing to form a good-natured bond with somebody who's treacherous. A newborn infant uh, has a lot of machinery that no one has very good ideas about yet. You see attempts to say that an infant is a learning machine that's relatively simple and it differs from an adult in just not knowing enough. I don't think that kind of theory will work very well. Uh, I, I suspect that when an infant is born, parts of its brain are already all set up to make frames. And other parts are all set up to look at the differences between pairs of frames to, to make those trans frames. And there are other parts that are designed to store temporal sequences like scripts and then there are semantic nets like the kind that Winston developed for his arch which are relationships between things in, in uh, no particular order very, very uh, free form. And then there are neural networks, which are connections between elements with no meaning at all, virtually just sort of numerical links. And I'll bet that uh, within the first year, the different parts of a baby's brain mature to, to sort of make it a specialized machine in, for trans frames and scripts and semantic nets and production systems and maybe three or four others. And so no one knows where to start. All of the attempts I've seen to make a childlike machine are based on, say, maybe this one idea of making something like Piaget's schemas or, or uh, Newell's pr and Simon's production rules or a certain kind of neural net or a certain kind of semantic net or a certain kind of finite state machine. Uh, each of the studies I've seen takes one such idea and says, maybe we could make a baby with that and it would learn something.